Our next panel is going to be hopefully a very exciting online games. We all like to play games. We all like to waste time, compete, laugh, and entertain. And so we're going to bring up Adrian Henney again to talk about um, the mobile's impacting of social games. So this theme of mobile in impacting our lives. Good afternoon again. Um, well, I hope you're not fed up with seeing me on this stage because it's already the third time today. But each time it's, it's, a different, it's a different subject of discussions. So now we're speaking about online games. And I'm very happy uh, to present to you Yelena Masolova. Yelena Masolova, come please on the stage. Yelena Masolova is one of Russia's most remarkable entrepreneurs. Um, she created, well, almost plenty of companies, <laughs> almost. Uh, plenty of games, at least. But one of her most brilliant success stories was uh, when she created Darbury.ru in 2010, which she sold to Groupon. So congrats. She also created, is the founder and CEO of Pixonic, which is one of Russia's leading uh, uh, mobile and social game uh, uh, publisher and developer. So, Yelena Masolova, welcome. I would also like to present to you uh, Sergei Orlovsky. Sergei Orlovsky has been in business for, uh, well, years and perhaps even decades because his company, uh, Nirval, was founded in 1996. Uh, they have offices headquartered in Moscow, but offices also in Ukraine, in Belarus, and, uh, and California. It's a global company and they do plenty of games. Um, uh, there are plenty of uh, strong games that they have been developing for more than 15 years. So, thank you for coming. Uh, I would like to ask you one first question. Can you describe this um, Russian and Ukrainian landscape of uh, game developers and publishers? And, and can, it, can it be compared to to, to the Western uh, companies, uh, is there something comparable to Zynga and things like that in Russia, in, the, in Eastern Europe? Well, I can speak only for uh, mobile and social sphere. Uh, first thing which comes to mind is that uh, everything, of course, is, mo is moving into, into mobile very, very, very fast. So as you know, in 2014, uh, the number of mobile internet users will be larger than uh, the number of uh, desktop internet users. So everything is moving into mobile and gaming is not an exception. So everything is moving there. Uh, same, uh, same for Big Sonic, same for our games, our revenues. So uh, this year in January, our um, mobile revenue was had 0% in total. Right now it's more than two thirds and it's growing like mad. So everything mm. is going into mobile. That's the, the, main, the main idea. Okay, we're going to discuss this, uh, the disruptive mobile models and the growth of uh, mobile in, in this uh, games uh, industry in a few minutes, but what, what does the landscape look like in, in, in Eastern Europe among developers and publishers? Well, some, uh, we're seeing some consolidations, some ac acquisitions. They're not large, but still some small studios are being acquired. That's, uh, that was expected because uh, roughly two years ago, everyone went into, uh, after Contactia opened its uh, API, everyone ran into social and thought that there are, I don't know, fields of gold or anything, they, they will become millionaires. Uh, right now we see, and it was expected, we see maybe five large players in social. Some of the, most of them are experimenting with mobile because they understand the trend. And uh, all these smaller studios are having hard time. So they are either uh, outsourcers for those larger players or they are being sometimes acquired or closed, which is the most common common. Sergey, I think there are three segments mainly uh, in Russia. One is client-based, it's large games. The second is mobile and social. So social is kind of stagnating right now, so it's not growing anymore. Uh, mobile is the biggest growing market, so it's the fastest growing market, while client-based games are still the majority it's the majority from revenue perspective and it's still growing growing pretty good and it's actually comparing to the other territories and other countries there is no big difference from that perspective and i think from uh, the point of being uh, competitive uh, 
Russian companies and in general Eastern European companies they are much more competitive in the smaller games and social and mobile rather than in client based but there are a few examples of very successful client based as well I'm not sure that uh, I don't quite agree because every time you come to Silicon uh, to Silicon Valley or to San Francisco to any meeting of game developers uh, what I noticed was the uh, higher uh, higher level of uh, understanding of technology, understanding of importance of marketing, how they track their users, how they count money. So um, just there are more companies, uh, people, people are going, uh, knowledge is spreading from one company into another. So just you don't see this uh, in, in Moscow and Ukraine. So Yeah, I can agree, but it's, it's more from... I mean, technically, technically, uh, they might be at the same level or even higher, but from the point of view of marketing, so they are low on average. Okay, okay. I, I heard that uh, Russian and um, uh, local uh, game publishers, they, they, they design their games for the global market. That the Russian market and Russian language market uh, is, is, is very small. Uh, is, it, is it true? Is it just considered as a small fraction of the global market and everyone develops your games for, for the Russian mobile market? I think it doesn't exist as well. Yeah. Because uh, mobile is global, it's clear. So uh, for us, only one percent of our revenue is uh, of our mobile revenue comes from Russia. Ninety-nine percent are outside Russia. We are not buying Chinese users. We're not buying Russian mm -hmm. users. We're buying US, UK, and K Korea. And there are no particular localization uh, issues when a, uh, a global hit comes to a country like Russia or vice versa. It's just a question of translation. There's no particular uh, adaptation uh, to do. Cut the rope works perfectly in many in any country, and uh, and the birds also, the angry birds also. Well, I don't think it's an issue. So okay. in mobile, at all. Um, can you tell me you are you have two brilliant companies? Uh, can you tell me very concretely uh, an example of, of great success, please, with some figures? Uh, uh, the number of users, daily users, uh, how. Can, can you tell me examples of your best success stories? Can you disclose? Well, Elena, tell me, tell us something. Um, uh, how much does it cost to develop a game, to market it? Uh, what is the uh, number of users you, 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 you can get? The lifetime value. Uh, can you offer us some, some, some figures okay, in case of the of success? Course, I won't tell all the numbers, but some figures um, I think I can just disclose. So we had more than 60 games uh, in our portfolio. Most of them were publishing, but I think roughly 25, 30 games were the games which we invested in and developed. Uh, uh, out of them, we had three super hits. When I mean super hit, this is a game which brought to us uh, uh, several million dollars net revenue so on our bank account so uh, to develop uh, such social game a year uh, two years ago you probably needed I don't know thirty thousand dollars initial in investment how many sorry thirty thousand plus a team of four developers needed to support it but nowadays it's it's I think it's uh, five to ten times uh, five to ten times more so uh, as for Robinson game, our mobile hit, uh, which, is, which also brought us several million dollars uh, in net revenue, uh, it took roughly $50,000 for initial development, but for mobile, uh, updates are critical. So you need uh, at least uh, twice per month to make some significant updates uh, for such games. That's why we, we have to support uh, the team and finance the team every month. So. Probably that, that answers your question. And as for marketing, uh, well, uh, uh, combined we spent several million dollars on, on marketing. That, that's general, but still so some estimate. Can you tell us, Sergey, one of your success stories in figures? I can tell a few. Uh, so we're doing a little bit more hardcore games rather than social. We don't do social. Uh, and uh, the numbers, they're substantially higher, both on the production, on life support, and uh, on marketing. 
So for, uh, for development, it usually takes from 1 million plus. So th the largest games we developed, uh, the production budget was more than $15 million. And uh, it's the games like Prime World or Elods Online, which you developed in the previous company. Uh, but this is client-based segment. Uh, and the revenues there are substantially higher than on social and mobile. So for the smaller format, it's usually one, from one to like $3 million. And uh, I think the market is going particularly this way uh, because uh, with the current market size, it actually doesn't matter how much money did you spend on development because um, it's fixed cost. You pay it once and then uh, the biggest challenge actually is to recoup your uh, marketing expense because by the end of the day, uh, the equation which you have for, for the, any project is you have user acquisition cost at one end and customer lifetime value on another end. And the biggest challenge uh, for the game is to make your customer lifetime value actually higher uh, than user acquisition. It sounds pretty obvious that it's kind of how the business could exist if it's not the case. However, if you take a look at many kind of successful companies, then they're still not recouping uh, customer lifetime, by customer lifetime value, the user acquisition. So uh, the first thing which you need to achieve with the game you develop is actually to make this equ equation working. And this is the problem for the social. What, the main reason why social games are stagnating at the moment that while uh, uh, user acquisition costs started rocketing up, uh, uh, customer lifetime value didn't grow that much, which resulted that uh, the regular kind of casual social games were not capable of growing because generating more money is not possible anymore because of low uh, immers uh, immersion in the game since they're casual. So. This is the biggest challenge and happened, this problem happened already in social. This is what's coming to mobile at the moment. There are lots of praises of mobile market at the moment, but nobody understands that actually current stage of mobile market is exactly the point what was in the social a year and a half ago. So in the next half a year, will be a very hard point to achieve this equation in the right way. Because once again, your customer acquisition will be growing, your customer lifetime value will not be growing that much. So you need to achieve this positive kind of cash flow on each user at least. And then, then once you achieve that, then, it's, then you're lucky because then you can expand your marketing expense and focus on to the market capacity and go into the space. But this is kind of second second step. You need to solve the first one, which is still hard. Do you consider games in your strategy like an investor would consider startups? I invest in 20 startups and it's natural that there are 15 failures and perhaps one or two or three will uh, grow very big. Is it the same kind of uh, statistic uh, uh, point of view? Well, for us it's very similar, yes. Uh, there's probably one difference uh, is that you try to stick with the best teams, uh, with the best developers, but maybe in venture capital it's the same. So it's often that funds invest in uh, entrepreneurs again and again in their companies. But it's similar, yes. Yeah. And uh, no one can predict uh, whether the game will be hit or not. So whatever they say. So no one knows. So one day before launch, no one knows. Yeah. From my opinion, it really depends on the approach. So if you do uh, kind of indie games, it's very hard to predict. They're very low cost in production but your probability of success is very small. However, if you achieve it, you can be another Angry Birds or Cut the Rope or something like that. Uh, we go more in kind of more industrial, more predictable approach. So in our case, it's roughly 50% of success, which is pretty good, but requires much more investment. Okay. Um, well, uh, you were speaking about mobile. Is it really uh, sweeping everything? Uh, it's no more, it's use, it, you cannot speak about social games anymore? Or is it just that mobile is growing much faster than everything else? 
and social keeps growing but not as fast. Well, all of the above because uh, audience is migrating into mobile and I think this is even bigger, larger problem than uh, uh, raise, uh, raising of the costs for marketing. So just audiences live in Facebook well, and very fast, fast going into, into mobile. Uh, we are, we are focusing on mobile, of course. And I think most social teams are now looking into mobile, posting their games, uh, launching something new. That's obvious. I believe in cross-platform, and that's what we do. Uh, because doing game for each particular platform uh, and tweak it for each particular platform is pretty hard. So right now, uh, with the 3D engines like Unity or HTML5, uh, uh, you can actually do the game uh, for every platform at the same time. And we consider mobile as the one of the major platforms, social as a secondary platform, but they still do the same game which you can start on one platform, continue in another. And it's actually pretty cool when you, for example, go to Facebook, start the game, and then you go to work, and in the metro you can use it on your I iPad, uh, kind of continue the game of play versus other gamers who are playing Facebook at the same time. So, kind of, I see the future when there are a lot of different screens, including consoles, digital TVs, like Apple TV or Google TV, which will happen in a while, et cetera, et cetera, and you have the same game everywhere. Uh, it's kind of challenging uh, be because lots of different limitations on different platforms, but still, I think this is the future of the industry and this is the only way to go. Um, you were telling us about the development costs, the marketing costs that are coming, that are going more and more considerable. Um, does it mean that it, there's, there's some chance left to small teams? Is it possible if you're a, small, a young entrepreneur and developer to, to try your chance? Or it's not only a big game player? Well, I think it's much more difficult now. So, uh, two years ago, when Cut the Rope, for example, launched, there were uh, a lot less high-quality games. Um, well, Ap Apple promoted them, so uh, there wasn't m that much competition. So, the costs for development were lower, the marketing costs were lower, uh, there were less quality content, so it was easier, much easier. Uh, now we see that marketing is skyrocketing, it's becoming much more, uh, marketing costs are skyrocketing, it's becoming much more sophisticated. So uh, for us, for example, we have uh, more than uh, 40 marketing partners. We need to track every partner, every little stream of marketing, so measure each, each little stream, understand its efficiency. Uh, you need instruments for this, uh, you need very serious analytics. Uh, well, Marketing uh, is more of a science here, so it's, it's not, not an art, of course. And of course, a small team of four developers can't, uh, can't have all this knowledge, can't spend as much resources, time, people on that. So it's still possible to have a hit, but it's, uh, the chances just are getting lower and lower. Sergey. Uh, I think the only way for the small team, uh, which is existing anymore, is to be very creative and to go into the kind of indie approach. So you do very, very creative, very small game and hope for success. Your success ratio would be like 1%, probably. But this is the best scenario which I see. So there is no any more space for the team of five people to be uh, kind of in, in line with the free-to-play model because even smaller games right now re require 20 people, 30 people, and this number would be growing on every platform. So if you five, you can't be on the kind of industrial part. You have to be on the indie part. Uh, that's my advice. There are less and less channels for uh, natural uh, organic growth, which previously uh, helped uh, uh, small teams sometimes uh, to launch, launch their game without any investment. So now you need investment. And uh, over time, you'll need more and more money to invest in marketing. So just Apple is shutting some opportunities. So it's, uh, you can't, uh, without marketing budgets, you just can't, uh, can't be high enough in charts. So, so if we're coming back to this uh, question of the landscape here, the local lands landscape in Eastern Europe, 
Uh, you are rather big players, certainly you are one of the giants of the market since you have been operating since 1986. You had time to grow. Uh, uh, what, who, who are the big players here? Uh, those who develop games, uh, who publish them? Uh, can you tell us a, bit, a few little about this? You mean in mobile and social or overall? Mobile and social in particular. Again, it's global. So you just, you know them, it's Zynga. And yes, but of all course, the... I mean, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian who work for global, either publishing their own games or developing them perhaps uh, in outsourcing uh, for uh, foreign companies. Uh, wh who are the players and uh, what is the most interesting to do today? You publish your own games or you also something? Okay, let me answer. Uh, I, I think still uh, social and mobile part is this kind of small part of the industry. So the biggest players are in client-based space. They're mail.ru and uh, wargaming.net with the World of Tanks game. Uh, they're kind of similar to each other uh, from S revenue. Similar to? Similar to each other from revenue perspective, which is funny. Since the, what, the first company has dozens of games, the second just one. So uh, on mobile and social, I think mm, the pretty obvious companies like Gaming Side, uh, which is pretty big in both spaces. Uh, we have we have Pixonic, we have uh, Zepta Lab, which I which I believe is one of the best case studies for their small team how to become a large company after the small uh, indie developer. Zeptolab. Zeptolab. Yes, the one who made Cut the Rope. Cut the Rope developer. Which became uh, the second or third largest after Angry, the Angry Birds or something? By downloads, not by revenue, unfortunately. But now they have raised another round of funding from Kite Ventures. And it's very interesting for me what will happen with their next games. Because uh, uh, will they be hits or not? So. Will they be of high quality or not? So I'm, I'm really waiting. So it's how, easier how to, to, to have one hit, and, but then you need to prove. But how can you analyze their success? Uh, because it's a small team that grew very big, or rather big. They had some success at least, uh, at least in one game and perhaps more. It? So you, you said it was difficult to, to, to do that now. It was unlikely. Did they, do the, did they do that just before it became difficult? Or were they very lucky or what? I can tell you that most of the people who are successful in this market were pretty lucky at some point. Uh, because normally you do your games and they do certain margin, but eventually you do one game which kind of bring you to the sky. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to achieve with a single game, but it's much easier to do with a portfolio. So if we, we're kind of on investment conference, so from success here is measured by ROI. Uh, so from ROI perspective, Zeptolab is probably the most successful among all of us. Uh, so that's the point. We have a bunch of other companies like Criar, Postgres, uh, uh, Progress Star, uh, uh, and, uh, and others. So they're pretty efficient, they're pretty successful, they're growing. Uh, while I see lots of consolidation, especially in social. Your analysis of Zeptolab, how could they be so lucky? Well, excellent team. Uh, uh, one of the founders worked in, uh, in Finland in another gaming company. He really accumulated uh, knowledge. So um, I don't think it, uh, well, I, not that I don't think, it's just obvious that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't luck. I think maybe it was 20% luck. 80% was skill. Um, skill, right, right timing, but uh, you never know what what will be a hit, hit or not. For example, our social hit, uh, the game which earned more than ten million dollars, is Little Helper. This is Russian favorite tale creature which cleans the house. So it's more than ten million dollars in social. Of course, the first game which we wanted to put into mobile was uh, this this that one. It was a co complete failure because the audience didn't understand. Uh, who who, the, who this hero is, what is he doing, etc. So uh, our next game was a success, but uh, I mean, it, it was global, but um, we couldn't have, um, I mean, it's hard to predict before you, before you launch the game. So. 
You never know. There is a good saying about it. To get overnight success, you need to spend 10 years. That's exactly the answer. Sergey, you raised the questions of uh, consolidation. Um, we have uh, discussed one hour ago a sector, an industry with very, very few uh, acquisitions and access, which was e-commerce uh, in Russia. Uh, what does it look like uh, in, in your industry? Is it mature enough to have uh, such moves? It's not a question of maturity. It's, uh, I think it's a question of cycle, economical cycle. So, for example, when you grow, there is no need for consolidation, usually at this point. Consolidation happens when the industry starts kind of stagnating or slowing down or going down. Uh, and this is what's happening in social. So I expect lots of consolidation there. This already happened worldwide, so it's, it's time to come to Russia and Eastern Europe. On mobile space, I don't expect it yet since it's growing. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, you're talking about one of these scenarios. Uh, it's when the company runs out of money. So it, uh, at this point it gets acquired, but it's not the only one. For example, uh, Zynga uh, was uh, acquired, uh, I think uh, they had 14, 14 deals uh, before pre-IPO. So they just needed developers. They needed to show to the uh, future investors that they have huge develop, uh, the huge, uh, huge portfolio of games huge development ca capacity, etc. So uh, this is a uh, second case when you are buying develop developers to, to show to investors. And the third case is when you are buying revenue. For example, you are already a public company. And you are traded with, I don't know, five uh, multiples. So you just buy the company at two multiple and, well, uh, the market reacts at it. So you just get, well, basically the margin. So there are lots, lots of cases. Uh, we are seeing consoli consolidations, acquisitions. We, we will see more. So. Are you going to IPO? No. I don't see any room for consolidations. <laughs> okay, then. Perhaps you have some questions to our guests. Please go ahead. Are there, <coughs> are there any questions? I think we should, guys, uh, one more question maybe, for the panel. Uh, maybe yeah. While the audience is thinking on the questions, um, in interesting, interesting statistics, um, we know that by number of downloads, uh, Google Play, so Android uh, smartphones, are, are now uh, way ahead of iPhone and iPads. But if you look at revenue, it was actually it's surprising, so not, not all people know it. By revenue, Apple is still way far, uh, way, way far larger than uh, Google Play. For example, um, every day, uh, Apple uh, pays three three million dollars uh, to iPhone developers, two point two million dollars to iPad developers, uh, the games, uh, while Google pays roughly six hundred eighty thousand per day. So and um, Kindle games, Amazon Kindle games are much less than four hundred, three hundred per day. So uh, this gives you uh, understanding of the scale. So so Apple is still the, the dominant pl platform. Okay, one, one question quickly. Um, hi, thank you. Very interesting session indeed. Um, in terms of lifetime customer value that you mentioned earlier, that, that's a challenge to recover, uh, <clears throat> or rather to, uh, from which you recover your marketing costs. Uh, what are the, the principal components now? Because you just mentioned that, uh, well, Apple sells a lot of apps, right? And a lot of apps get downloaded uh, at Google Play. But, you know, if you take a longer time perspective at the customer uh, who's using your app for a while, might it be that in app purchase, et cetera, et cetera, will make up for that? What's your take on it? Just uh, it's not even the question that in app purchases uh, and free to play games dominate. I, uh, now, I think more than two thirds of revenue comes from free to play games. So you get lots of user seen, and then there are those conversions. Uh, so you look at them. As for um, influencing your LTV, well, it's uh, just lots of tweaking. You just change the game, look at the uh, data, make another changes, look at the data. So just lots of lots of iterations, and your game uh, be becomes uh, the, the numbers uh, become bad. Uh, so. I think uh, there are two key factors: percentage of paying users and our our poo average revenue per paying user. Uh, and it's pretty obvious. However, 
the factor which is much less obvious but much more influencing uh, kind of recoupability of the marketing is actually retention. And if you look, if you build a simple model, you will see that kind of one percent in retention can give you much more than one percent in any other conversion. Uh, so this was the pitfall for their social, uh, kind of casual social games. It's much better in hardcore uh, social and mobile games. So uh, this, and this factor is actually reflecting the game quality to the certain point. So increasing your game quality leads you to the better retention, which eventually through the whole conversion cycle will give you much better CLV. So after all, no matter what you do, make the good game. That's it. Very, very last question. Mm -hmm. If it's a 30 second, an answer in 30 seconds too. We have one minute left. Good. Why don't you just ask another question if you have it? It looks like the audience is ready for their startup session. Okay, no last question. It means one minute more for the next session. Okay, fantastic guys. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, Adrian.